Story seven of The House with the Mezzanine and Other Stories by Anton Chekhov. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Story seven My Life, the Story of a Provincial, Parts fourteen, fifteen, and sixteen. Part fourteen. And my sister, too, was living with her own private thoughts, which she hid from me. She used often to sit whispering with Masha. When I went up to her, she would shrink away, and her eyes would look guilty and full of entreaty. Evidently there was something going on in her soul of which she was afraid or ashamed. To avoid meeting me in the garden or being left alone with me, she clung to Masha, and I hardly ever had a chance to talk to her except at dinner. One evening, on my way home from the school, I came quietly through the garden. It had already begun to grow dark. Without noticing me or hearing footsteps, my sister walked round an old, wide-spreading apple tree, perfectly noiselessly like a ghost. She was in black, and walked very quickly, up and down, up and down, with her eyes on the ground. An apple fell from the tree. She started at the noise, stopped, and pressed her hands to her temples. At that moment I went up to her. In an impulse of tenderness, which suddenly came rushing to my heart, with tears in my eyes, somehow remembering our mother and our childhood, I took hold of her shoulders and kissed her. "'What is the matter?' I asked. "'You are suffering. I have seen it for a long time now. Tell me, what is the matter?' "'I am afraid,' she murmured with a shiver. "'What's the matter with you?' I inquired. "'For God's sake, be frank.' "'I will. I will be frank. I will tell you the whole truth.' It is so hard, so painful, to conceal anything from you. Messel, I am in love. She went on in a whisper. Love, love. I, I am happy, but I am afraid. I heard footsteps, and Dr. Blagovo appeared among the trees. He was wearing a silk shirt and high boots. Clearly they had arranged a rendezvous by the apple tree. When she saw him, she flung herself impulsively into his arms with a cry of anguish, as though he was being taken away from her. Vladimir! Vladimir! She clung to him and gazed eagerly at him, and only then I noticed how thin and pale she had become. It was especially noticeable through her lace collar, which I had known for years, for it now hung loosely about her slim neck. The doctor was taken aback, but controlled himself at once, and said, as he stroked her hair, "'That's enough, enough. Why are you so nervous? You see, I have come.' We were silent for a time, bashfully glancing at each other. Then we all moved away, and I heard the doctor saying to me, "'Civilized life has not yet begun with us.' The old console themselves with saying that, if there is nothing now, there was something in the forties and the sixties. That is all right for the old ones, but we are young, and our brains are not yet touched with senile decay. We cannot console ourselves with such illusions. The beginning of Russia was in 862, and civilized Russia, as I understand it, has not yet begun. But I could not bother about what he was saying. It was very strange, but I could not believe that my sister was in love, that she had just been walking with her hand on the arm of a stranger and gazing at him tenderly. My sister, poor, frightened, timid, downtrodden creature as she was, loved a man who was already married and had children. I was full of pity without knowing why. The doctor's presence was distasteful to me, and I could not make out what was to come of such a love. End of Part 14 Part 15 Masha and I drove over to Kurilovka for the opening of the school. Autumn, 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 said Masha, looking about her. Summer had passed. There were no birds, and only the willows were green. Yes, summer had passed. 
The days were bright and warm, but it was fresh in the mornings. The shepherds went out in their sheepskins, and the dew never dried all day on the asters in the garden. There were continual mournful sounds, and it was impossible to tell whether it was a shutter creaking on its rusty hinges or the cranes flying, and one felt so well and so full of the desire for life. "'Summer has passed,' said Masha. "'Now we can both make up our accounts. We have worked hard and thought a great deal, and we are the better for it. All honour and praise to us. We have improved ourselves. But have our successes had any perceptible influence on the life around us? Have they been of any use to a single person? No. Ignorance, dirt, drunkenness, a terribly high rate of infant mortality. Everything is just as it was, and no one is any the better for your having ploughed and sown, and my having spent money and read books. Evidently we have only worked and broadened our minds for ourselves. I was abashed by such arguments, and did not know what to think. From beginning to end we have been sincere, I said, and if a man is sincere he is right. Well, who denies that? We have been right, but we have been wrong in our way of setting about it. First of all, are not our very ways of living wrong? You want to be useful to people, but by the mere fact of buying an estate you make it impossible to be so. Further, if you work, dress, and eat like a peasant, you lend your authority and approval to the clumsy clothes and their dreadful houses and their dirty beards. On the other hand, suppose you work for a long, long time, all your life, and in the end obtain some practical results. What will your results amount to? What can they do against such elemental forces as wholesale ignorance, hunger, cold, and degeneracy? A drop in the ocean. Other methods of fighting are necessary, strong, bold, quick. If you want to be useful, then you must leave the narrow circle of common activity and try to act directly on the masses. First of all, you need vigorous, noisy propaganda. Why are art and music, for instance, so much alive and so popular and so powerful? Because the musician or the singer influences thousands directly. Art! Wonderful art! She looked wistfully at the sky and went on, Art gives wings and carries you far, far away. If you are bored with dirt and pettifogging interests, if you are exasperated and outraged and indignant, rest and satisfaction are only to be found in beauty. As we approached Kirilovka, the weather was fine, clear, and joyous. In the yards the peasants were thrashing, and there was a smell of corn and straw. Behind the wattled hedges the fruit trees were reddening, and all around the trees were red or golden. In the church tower the bells were ringing, the children were carrying icons to the school and singing the litany of the Virgin. And how clear the air was, and how high the doves soared! The Te Deum was sung in the schoolroom. Then the Kurilovka peasants presented Masha with an icon, and the Dubechnia peasants gave her a large cracknel and a gilt salt cellar, and Masha began to weep. And if we have said anything out of the way, or have been discontented, please forgive us, said an old peasant, bowing to us both. As we drove home, Masha looked back at the school. The green roof which I had painted glistened in the sun, and we could see it for a long time, and I felt that Masha's glances were glances of farewell. End of Part 15 Part 16 In the evening she got ready to go to town. She had often been to town lately to stay the night. In her absence I could not work, and felt listless and disheartened. Our big yard seemed dreary, disgusting, and deserted. There were ominous noises in the garden, and without her the house, the trees, the horses were no longer ours. 
I never went out, but sat all the time at her writing-table among her books on farming and agriculture, those deposed favourites, wanted no more, which looked out at me so shamefacedly from the bookcase. For hours together, while it struck seven, eight, nine, and the autumn night crept up as black as soot to the windows, I sat brooding over an old glove of hers, or the pen she always used, and her little scissors. I did nothing, and saw clearly that everything I had done before, ploughing, sowing, and felling trees, had only been because she wanted it. And if she told me to clean out a well, when I had to stand waist-deep in water, I would go and do it, without trying to find out whether the well wanted cleaning or not. And now, when she was away, Dubechnia, with its squalor, its litter, its slamming shutters, with thieves prowling about it day and night, seemed to me like a chaos in which work was entirely useless. And why should I work, then? Why trouble and worry about the future, when I felt that the ground was slipping away from under me, that my position at Dubechnia was hollow? that, in a word, the same fate awaited me as had befallen the books on agriculture. Oh, what anguish it was at night, in the lonely hours, when I lay listening uneasily, as though I expected some one any minute to call out that it was time for me to go away. I was not sorry to leave Dubechnia. My sorrow was for my love, for which it seemed that autumn had already begun. What a tremendous happiness it is to love, and to be loved, and what a horror it is to feel that you are beginning to topple down from that lofty tower. Masha returned from town toward evening on the following day. She was dissatisfied with something, but concealed it, and said only, Why have the winter windows been put in? It will be stifling. I opened two of the windows. We did not feel like eating, but we sat down and had supper. "'Go and wash your hands,' she said. "'You smell of putty.' She had brought some new illustrated magazines from town, and we both read them after supper. They had supplements with fashion plates and patterns. Masha just glanced at them and put them aside to look at them carefully later on. But one dress, with a wide, bell-shaped skirt and big sleeves, interested her, and for a moment she looked at it seriously and attentively. "'That's not bad,' she said. "'Yes, it would suit you very well,' said I. "'Very well.' And I admired the dress, only because she liked it, and went on tenderly. "'A wonderful, lovely dress. Lovely, wonderful, Masha, my dear Masha.' and tears began to drop on the fashion-plate. "'Wonderful Masha,' I murmured. "'Dear, darling Masha!' She went and lay down, and I sat still for an hour and looked at the illustrations. "'You should not have opened the windows,' she called from the bedroom. "'I'm afraid it will be cold. Look how the wind is blowing in.' I read the miscellany about the preparation of cheap fish and the size of the largest diamond in the world. Then I chanced on the picture of the dress she had liked, and I imagined her at a ball, with a fan and bare shoulders, a brilliant, dazzling figure, well up in music and painting and literature, and how insignificant and brief my share in her life seemed to be. Our coming together— our marriage was only an episode, one of many in the life of this lively, highly gifted creature. All the best things in the world, as I have said, were at her service, and she had them for nothing. Even ideas and fashionable intellectual movements served her pleasure, a diversion in her existence, and I was only the coachman who drove her from one infatuation to another. Now I was no longer necessary to her. She would fly away, and I should be left alone. As if in answer to my thoughts, a desperate scream suddenly came from the yard. Murder! It was a shrill female voice, and exactly as though it were trying to imitate it, the wind also howled dismally in the chimney. 
Half a minute passed and again it came through the sound of the wind, but as though from the other end of the yard. Murder! Miss Sale, did you hear that? said my wife in a hushed voice. Did you hear? She came out of the bedroom in her nightgown, with her hair down, and stood listening and staring out of the dark window. "'Somebody's being murdered,' she muttered. "'It only wanted that.' I took my gun and went out. It was very dark outside. A violent wind was blowing, so that it was hard to stand up. I walked to the gate and listened. The trees were moaning, the wind went whistling through them, and in the garden the idiot's dog was howling. Beyond the gate it was pitch dark. There was not a light on the railway. And just by the wing, where the offices used to be, I suddenly heard a choking cry, Murder! Who is there? I called. Two men were locked in a struggle. One had nearly thrown the other, who was resisting with all his might and both were breathing heavily. "'Let go!' said one of them, and I recognized Ivan Cheprakov. It was he who had cried out in a thin, falsetto voice, "'Let go, damn you, or I'll bite your hands!' The other man I recognized as Moisey. I parted them, and could not resist hitting Moisey in the face twice. He fell down, and then got up, and I struck him again. "'He tried to kill me!' he muttered. I caught him creeping to his mother's drawer. I tried to shut him up in the wing for safety. Cheprakov was drunk and did not recognize me. He stood gasping for breath as though trying to get enough wind to shriek again. I left them and went back to the house. My wife was lying on the bed, fully dressed. I told her what had happened in the yard and did not keep back the fact that I had struck Moisey. Living in the country is horrible, she said, and what a long night it is. Murder! we heard again, a little later. I'll go and part them, I said. No, let them kill each other, she said, with an expression of disgust. She lay staring at the ceiling, listening, and I sat near her, not daring to speak, and feeling that it was my fault that screams of murder came from the yard, and the night was so long. We were silent, and I waited impatiently for the light to peep in at the window. And Masha looked as though she had awakened from a long sleep, and was astonished to find herself so clever, so educated, so refined, cast away in this miserable provincial hole, among a lot of petty, shallow people, and to think that she could have so far forgotten herself as to have been carried away by one of them, and to have been his wife for more than half a year. It seemed to me that we were all the same to her, myself, Moisey, Cheprakov, all swept together into the drunken, wild scream of murder, myself, our marriage, our work, and the muddy roads of autumn and when she breathed or stirred to make herself more comfortable, I could read in her eyes, oh, if the morning would come quicker. In the morning she went away. I stayed at Dubechnia for another three days, waiting for her, then I moved all our things into one room, locked it, and went to town. When I rang the bell at the engineer's, it was evening, and the lamps were alight in Great Gentry Street. Pavel told me that nobody was at home. Viktor Ivanitch had gone to Petersburg, and Maria Viktorovna must be at a rehearsal at the Azequins. I remember the excitement with which I went to the Azequins, and how my heart thumped and sank within me as I went upstairs and stood for a long while on the landing, not daring to enter the Temple of the Muses. In the hall, on the table, on the piano, on the stage there were candles burning all in threes, for the first performance was fixed for the thirteenth, and the dress rehearsal was on Monday, the unlucky day. A fight against prejudice. All the lovers of dramatic art were assembled. The eldest, the middle, and the youngest, Miss Azequin, were walking about the stage, reading their parts. Radish was standing still in the corner all by himself, with his head against the wall, looking at the stage with adoring eyes, waiting for the beginning of the rehearsal. Everything was just the same. 
I went toward my hostess to greet her, when suddenly everybody began to say, shh, and to wave their hands to tell me not to make such a noise. There was a silence. The top of the piano was raised. A lady sat down, screwing up her short-sighted eyes at the music, and Masha stood by the piano, dressed up, beautiful, but beautiful in an odd new way, not at all like the Masha who used to come to see me at the mill in the spring. She began to sing, Why do I love thee, straight night? It was the first time since I had known her that I had heard her sing. She had a fine, rich, powerful voice, and to hear her sing was like eating a ripe, sweet-scented melon. She finished the song and was applauded. She smiled and looked pleased, made play with her eyes, stared at the music, plucked at her dress, exactly like a bird which has broken out of its cage and preens its wings at liberty. Her hair was combed back over her ears, and she had a sly, defiant expression on her face, as though she wished to challenge us all, or to shout at us, as though we were horses, "'Gee up, old things!' And at that moment she must have looked very like her grandfather, the coachman. "'You here, too?' she asked, giving me her hand. "'Did you hear me sing? How did you like it?' And without waiting for me to answer, she went on, you arrived very opportunely. I'm going to Petersburg for a short time to-night. May I? At midnight I took her to the station. She embraced me tenderly, probably out of gratitude, because I did not pester her with useless questions, and she promised to write to me, and I held her hands for a long time and kissed them, finding it hard to keep back my tears and not saying a word. And when the train moved, I stood looking at the receding lights, kissed her in my imagination, and whispered, Masha, dear, wonderful Masha. I spent the night at Mikhakov at Karpovna's, and in the morning I worked with Radish, upholstering the furniture at a rich merchant's who had married his daughter to a doctor. End of Part 16